I got to tell you, this saga has been personal to me from the very beginning. After serving four years in the U.S. Air Force, my entire life has been about investing and helping individual investors. And I can tell you, I've had my ups and downs, and I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way. I have seen this system from the inside, and I know there has never been a level playing field. Yet I encourage people to participate because it is the greatest wealth creation machine in the history of mankind. Even with the unfairness marbled throughout the system and a public relations campaign that's always been designed to keep individual investors chained to the dependence of professionals, I encourage and continue to encourage everyone to be in the stock market. I mean, let's face it, people had been losing faith in the market. In the midst of a 10-year market rally, investors actually pulled out tens of billions from U.S. equity mutual funds. Meanwhile, young adults uh, saw can't-miss long buy ideas mom and dad like IBM and GE only go straight down. So what's a millennial to do when they see a headline like this? Goldman Sachs traders made more than $100 million on 14 separate days amid their first quarter's fierce volatility. I mean, the trading desk at Goldman posted gains on 53 of 62 trading days, all while encouraging the public to settle for pedestrian gains of about 7% a year for their own accounts. So I think the reaction from the financial media has been despicable in general, calling these traders dumb and doomed to fail. And many of them, by the way, made a lot of money long before financial media even caught wind that this was going on. I mean, I've been asking my own guests for short squeeze ideas for months before it officially became a frenzy. You know, I don't think anyone is really out there looking out for the small investor. Because if Wall Street cared or the financial media cared about them losing money, then why didn't they say something when they lost a collective $400 billion on just five blue chip names alone last year? I mean, heck, 40% of the S&P 500 were big losers last year. And this whole thing has been about keeping people in their lanes. Of course, some people will lose money and some people will make money. And if there were no risk, there would be no financial media. There would be no need for advisors. I mean, we'd all just buy these great stocks that were certain to go up and never have any dips and do something else. Here's the thing. My greatest hope is for folks not to lose their faith in the ability to use all this information now at their fingertips to make trading and investing decisions and make this a lifelong endeavor. And maybe, and maybe they will get a break from regulators and others that feel the, the need to sort of right now always tilt the odds in favor of those hedge fund giants. Before we go, I want to give you my thoughts for the week. And of course, I've got to begin with AMC and those meme stocks which have given the establishment fits and, well, they keep talking about the smart money while 100% disregarding the intellect of those folks who are buying. Now, I haven't bought this round, but I did make a small fortune in my own account and a few names that were swept up in the meme rally earlier this year. Now, here's the problem taking profits too soon only to watch these stocks continue to rise. Here's the thing. The big problem with buying stocks on a hunch or a tip is you never really understand their true value or potential. The upside is a complete guessing game. I'm suggesting that investors learn more about the fundamentals. And by the way, if you're a trader, never worry about trading. That's what you're trying to do. Now, here's one from Edward concerning not cutting losers quick enough. Well, for me, there's, there's really two schools of thought here, right? And I want to touch on A, Losses are part of long-term investing, right? If you're going to be successful, you're going to take losses. And dealing with them mentally is a big key to maximizing that effort. Know what you bought, uh, you know, what you bought in a stock and take care not to label it a loser also. And, and the reason I say this, the stocks go down, doesn't make it a loser. It's only a loser when you take, the, take a hit, right? I got to be honest, some of my biggest winners, I'm talking biggest winners personally, initially were against me, but I bought them based on fundamentals, which brings me to another narrative I want to talk about here, that certain stocks are doomed, right? I heard this a million times and I've seen it be wrong just as often. This morning, Kohl's, you know Kohl's, that little store that, that was in trouble, fetched an outperform rating at Cowan. Now, last March, every single firm on Wall Street, every financial commentator said the company was doomed. Many times buying these names when the experts say that they're going to die and go out of business is probably the best time. Just make sure you do your homework. Market as if it were a single entity and, and not a marketplace where thousands of individual stocks are bought and sold. Now, I bring this up because for those looking for true long-term investing success, the stocks uh, in the stock market, you're going to have to go beyond these headlines, folks. In my book, Unstoppable Prosperity, I focus on three drivers of individual stocks, which in turn 
power the overall stock market. Yesterday, by the way, was a great example of these three drivers. 10% of the moves in this market, that comes from behavioral. It's all about emotions. It's how we get overbought and oversold conditions. This is how we get money off the sidelines. The improved tone between the U.S. and China yesterday, coupled with the daily new highs, helped get us that emotional lift. But that's only 10% of it. 30% of investing in what moves markets is technical factors. These measure the confidence and uncertainty of current shareholders in real time. I got to tell you, remarkable how effective this measure is in predicting near-term moves in individual stocks. But the big one, the most important thing, fundamentals, focusing on the facts and actual real live developments. Yesterday, uh, the most trade related stocks, uh, let's face it, they were mostly flat or down. I mean, the biggest influence of winners yesterday uh, powered this market higher. It was the fundamental news from earnings. Now, ultimately, fundamentals determine where the individual stocks go. They, in turn, determine where the overall stock market goes. So when you know the fundamentals, you can better weather moves that are triggered either by behavioral or technical factors. It's how you hang in there when the market gets hit. Today, in fact, uh, big factors uh, that, that help, again, corporate earnings, monster economic data, signs of improvement in manufacturing. Now, I appreciate everyone who watches my show, but I really feel every single day I could do just a little bit more. You should be better informed because it's your economic future. I want to help, and I'm bringing in two of the best to help us right now. Money Map. Well, here's the thing, uh, Brett. Uh, I, I've been doing this for over 30 years. Uh, I, I've taken companies public as a broker. I took my own company public, and I've been a consultant. I know this industry inside and out. And this has been one area that, that has upset me tremendously for a long time. Now, market purists and, and, and you know these rich head funds folks always say, hey, shorting is good. It helps liquidity. It keeps the market running. It's a pretty good thing. What's not a good thing is if you issue Brett, if you issued 10 shares in, in Brett Bear Incorporated and somebody saw that it was worth $100 and thought, maybe I can drive this to a buck. It's a great company. So and somehow they were able to borrow 20 shares. Now, you only issued 10, but somehow they can borrow 20 and sell it and keep selling it and pound it and pound it and pound it and pound it into submission. And along the way, all the investors who believe in Brett Bear Incorporated also lose their shirt. And this is what's happening. This is not about trading. This is about a, a cottage industry of very wealthy billionaires who have been able to pound stocks into complete submission. It's not about a trade. It's not about them thinking something is oversold. It's about them thinking that a stock is hopeless, that there's no brokerage firms covering it, or that most brokerage firms have a hold rating on it, maybe a sell rating. No one's going to come to its defense. They're not looking for a trade. They're looking for total submission. So all of a sudden, you get a bunch of not, young investors, mostly novice investors, excited, and they, and they start to notice, hey, if you buy these stocks up, sometimes they get squeezed. So the person that's shorted your stock at 10 may have to buy it at 12, may have to buy it at 14. They start getting a little nervous, and on and on and on. This is what we call a classic short squeeze. It's the ultimate short squeeze. Now what compounds the error, the problem, in addition to these hedge funds already being able to borrow unlimited amounts of stock, and artificially sell it, right? This is not a real market. They are making a market to the downside. Now on top of this today, you have all of these platforms, including Robinhood, and I say shame on them, who have stopped these same investors from buying the stock. So guess what? They can only sell it. <laughs> okay, they can sell it, the shorts can sell it. Of course it's gonna go down. It's really a, a serious injustice. And if something's gonna be done, something should be done on the ability to, to get 140% of a company's float, uh, which obviously doesn't yeah. exist, and sell it into the market. I think you start there. Right. So, you know, for the people who say, listen, we're doing this to protect the little guy, you say what? The little guy, some little guys made a lot of money in a short period of time, um, but there could be some holding the bag at the end, and the big guys often don't. Well, the big guys get theirs, but here's the thing. I, I just think it's a disingenuous argument. Uh, 20 years ago, General Electric was, General Electric was the number one stock in the, in, the, in the entire world. It was the number one market cap, and Wall Street said, hey, said to everybody, put this in your retirement fund. All right, 50 bucks a share. It went to 10. It went to six. It went to six. Uh, you know, so you can lose money on the bluest of blue chip stocks. 
the bottom line is the stock market's supposed to be democratized. Everyone's supposed to be able to take a shot. And if you and if you get burned, you get burned. That's what the stock market is. It's a free market exchange. I think it's going higher. You think it's going lower. Let's play by the same rules. So I don't think that these platforms did this for the little guy. I really believe they circled the wagons to help the hedge funds who control Wall Street, who, by the way, buy the order flow from Robin Hood. So they didn't do this to save the little guy. You don't, you don't seduce people into trading by giving them free stock and these commercials and talking about the beauty of investing. And then when you have the biggest folks on Wall Street right there ready to crack, pull a rug out from under those same people you seduce yeah. into the market. It's a shame. It really is. Charles, I love your perspective on it, and this is not the end of this story. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, man.